Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Maria Spatio. I'm the general manager of CBAR. Would like to thank everyone for uh, being here this morning, and would like to thank uh, and extend our heartfelt gratitude to our speakers. Um, unfortunately, the printing company Little Press has failed us and has only delivered a few uh, samples of the book alone, uh, which everyone can see at the entrance at the reception. And if you're interested in uh, in pre-ordering or in having a look when it's uh, at the CVAR delivered, then please feel free to leave your contacts and uh, we'll contact you to uh, inform you of its arrival. And uh, lastly, we'd like to thank the EA Norway Grants and the Active Citizens Fund for making this event possible. And I'd like to call Mr. Mr. Kaffenberger to, for his uh, uh, presentation. Thank you. So... Shall I? Yeah. Is yeah. it? Uh, uh, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming uh, on a Saturday morning to hear about the photographs of Camille Onla that uh, I have to say I, I had the pleasure and I thank it as a very for this occasion to spend two months with. Uh, um, looking at each and every photo of this big collection and describing them. And what I have prepared for today is uh, the site that perhaps people know the least about his work in Cyprus. Well, you know that he came here to study the French Gothic monuments uh, of the island. But um, he also developed a not untroubled, I want to say, relationship with the Greek churches of rural Cyprus, but we will look at uh, the examples where he found particular interest in them and um, look at the, the many reasons why he, um, he took an interest in one or the other monument. Um, First, a few words about the background of Onla that uh, seem to be uh, in place to, to open a conference such as this. He was born uh, in uh, November 1862 uh, in Boulogne-sur-Mer, which is in the northwest uh, of France. And um, uh, I, I think the, this very place already had an impact on how he later dealt with architecture because he was born into this village that owned uh, a splendid medieval church that was the year that he was born, uh, more or less taken down to be replaced by um, ooh, something happening here that was not planned. Okay, we're back. Um, so uh, it was replaced by this uh, monumental classicist basilica, only keeping uh, the sculpted fragments uh, of the old Romanesque church on, on site. So uh, it was the first occasion for him growing up to see this assemblage of fragmented uh, medieval uh, splendor, which is something that then sort of accompanies him throughout his career, that he's always seeking out places that reflect in a fragmentary state uh, some, some marvelous medieval buildings. Um, the next important point in his career was uh, 1889 to 1891, when he traveled through Italy on the first uh, grant um, with the aim to uh, already find French art outside of France. So uh, in his obituary, Marcel Aubert speaks about uh, him being uh, very interested all his life in the spread of French art outside of France. So, so this is sort of the outset of his mindset. And I show you the, the picture and drawing he uh, did of uh, the uh, Abbey ruin of San Galgano. Um, I have to say that already there, uh, he was not very <coughs> favorable to those monuments that didn't look French enough. So Milano Cathedral, for example, uh, he found uh, absolutely horrible. Um, and this is important to keep in mind where he started with his mindset. I will come at the very end to uh, what all, also his uh, journeys through Cyprus uh, turned him into over the course of uh, the years. 
But in the beginning, um, he uh, came here, he studied the big buildings, such as the Cathedral of Nicosia, of course. And then in his book, he uh, says this remarkable sentence that um, while uh, the customs, language, and arts of France did not take possession of the country to the extent of driving out Byzantine traditions, um, there were uh, the uh, French settlers, numerous in and intelligent, uh, as opposed to the indigenous population, sparse, inactive, and poorly educated. Um, so they underwent uh, the influence of the conquerors and uh, in turn had almost no effect on them. So for him, when he arrived here and also when he published the book, it was really a very clear image of, of well, this rather typical French cultural chauvinism of that very specific period um, where, uh, well, knowledge and uh, culture was brought to uncultivated areas through the <coughs> conquering. Um, but uh, his work drive was already fueled by this desire to explore unexplored areas and discover monuments that are largely unknown to the scholarly community. Um, and he did not fear the discomfort of traveling also in areas that did not have the most comfortable of hotels, and uh, there are many descriptions of how he took the donkeys to get from here to Famagusta, to, uh, to the Carpas, etc. And, um, and, well, he complains occasionally about how dirty everything is uh, during his travels. But um, he's still going there, which many of his colleagues didn't do, so he was interested in exploring places that uh, also previous travelers, such as Tutois, had not seen. Um, then I, I put together a few of the uh, comments that already show an ambiguous image of how he uh, processed the encounter of um, rural monuments uh, in his book. So, first of all, well, he complains that in remote regions away from the centers, the Trodos, Trisopu, uh, Karpas, one can travel for a week without finding a tr truly Gothic building. Well, today that's hardly surprising to us, but um, he had hoped for more, I assume. Um, he goes on, the, the contrast is striking between the beautiful Gothic buildings of Famagusta and Nicosia and the miserable Byzantine buildings of the villages. So this is, again, the, 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 that, that approach that he had from the very beginning. But then, uh, there it gets interesting, um, he takes the time in his introduction to say, that there remain two categories of Cypriot medieval monuments for the study of which time has been lacking. So he, he still thinks that it would be worth to study those in more detail. The Byzantine churches, several of which may, and that's extremely interesting, during the time of pilgrimages have had some influence on Western art. So this is the first recognition that this verdict uh, that the Byzantine is just folkloric and has no uh, whatsoever reflection back um, might not be uh, completely true. Uh, and uh, the frescoes. We will not talk about the frescoes, but, and I apologize for this not very attractive slide um, that I put there for informative reasons. He adds a footnote um, very at the end of the introduction where he makes a list of all those monuments, Byzantine monuments that he encountered uh, during his travels found interesting and worth to be studied, but that he had no, no time to, to discuss in detail. So um, uh, th there are the, the famous ones that we still deal with today, uh, like uh, the Antiphonitis Monastery and so on, but there are also very surprising uh, entries like Pisuri. Um, I'm, I'm wondering until today what he might have seen there uh, in terms of Byzantine churches or the Panaya Melissa, which is a very inconspicuous, a small medieval church uh, um, towards the northern coast. Um, so it's, it remains a bit mysterious what exactly he means with all these entries, and uh, I underlined those that we know he took pictures of. There might have been more. We'll see that as well. But in any case, uh, this shows already that uh, he had 
he had more of an interest and a curiosity for these monuments than perhaps the political framing of his work also allowed him to show in the text that he published in the end. Um, what I will do now is to just go in, well, in a type of journey through the island with Onla, uh, trying to reconstruct some of the ways how he came about um, the monuments that are documented in his photographs. So we, we don't go very far just to the suburbs today, uh, to, the, um, to the monastery of the Archangel, and uh, of course we know that he was interested in this monument particularly because of the very, I would say, gothic look of it. So it has decorated portals, it has well-cut ashlars, which for him was already a sign of sophistication of the architecture. So, so whenever he saw something like that, the impulse was to consider it um, Western in appeal. And um, so uh, it's not very surprising that he took the time to take several pictures of this monument. And as you can see on the pictures, very little has changed uh, on this site uh, since on last times, except for, of course, the huge parking place around. Um, he went further on, and I assume this must have been some sort of a day trip uh, along the valley. He went further on to the uh, Chrysostiliotisa cave, which um, I'm wondering if he actually visited the inside, because you can see that back then, uh, of course, there were no big stairs up to the cave. And uh, it, it seems to me that in passing by, it was pointed out to him that this is a, an important place of the local veneration, and he took this picture from the road. Um, the destination of this day trip, it seems, was uh, in the Irakidos Monastery, uh, of which we have this wonderful picture that, uh, in this case, shows somebody who clearly is a travel companion of his, uh, by the attire um, that the woman is wearing and uh, a priest uh, in the background, uh, a bit in the slightly damaged part of the photo. And um, this is uh, the, the first time now that we see one of the issues with uh, approaching the photographs like this. Of course, every set of on last photographs is not a full reflection of all the pictures that he took. Um, the, um, his his photographs got split up over time, and especially those that he used for publications um, are less present in archival collections. So this is uh, the photo on the right, um, is from an article that he published in the 1920s, but it doesn't appear uh, in, uh, in the photo, photographic collection here. So um, this is just to, to keep in mind that whenever I say this, he didn't take a photo of this, he took a photo of, there is a limit to this argumentation. Uh, he might have been interested in more things. He might have taken more pictures that are simply not preserved today. In any case, what he was interested in there was uh, the um, mausoleum uh, in the east of the church. Again, there were pointed arches, very nicely uh, cut ashlar masonry. So this, this was something that he could relate to a bit better. And then he went through the... Um, treasure of the monastery and took several pictures of the, the silver and gold objects in there. Um, another trip took him south of Nicosia, uh, of course, to the, to the royal manor of uh, Potamia. Um, and when going there, he found several monuments, uh, again, probably more by coincidence or by locals telling him what there is that uh, ended up in his book uh, among the big Latin monuments. Uh, for one, that's the um, unfinished church in Aiosozomenos. Uh, his photos are very important for us because, of course, the state has massively changed since he saw the church, so half of the church is missing today compared to what he saw. Um, and the cemetery church, uh, cemetery church of uh, Dali, which um, is on exactly the same level of, uh, how should I say, gothicness as uh, many other of the rural monuments of Cyprus. But he 
chose to speak about this one, perhaps not due, uh, due to uh, balancing their importance, but simply because he passed the church, he found it interesting, and he took it as an important example of what, um, as he calls it, what happened in the 15th century to the traditions of French architecture in Cyprus when they fell into the hands of Greeks directed by Venetians. So, so you, you, you can see his face going a bit uh, uh, when, when he wrote this, but um, still he can't hide that he's intrigued by these monuments. Um, it's also an interesting monument because it's one of the few cases where uh, he, uh, who was a very keen observer, makes a mistake. In his observation, he doesn't see that uh, the vaults were an addition of the um, late 19th century and that the church had been standing as a roofless ruin uh, before, which is even more surprising as he had the drawings of Edmond Dutois uh, at his disposal and uh, Dutois drew the church without roof. So uh, it's, um, it might also show that he spent more time dealing with the bigger Gothic monuments that he overlooked this fact. Then, of course, in the next journey uh, took him to the Royal Chapel in uh, Pirga, um, which again led to a rather detailed uh, exploration of that micro-region around the, this monument. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a picture of the Aya Marina in Pirga that he took, but he mentions it in this uh, previously shown very long footnote as an important example of 15th century painting, which is again surprising because today we wouldn't count it among the most important remnants of medieval painting in Cyprus. But again, it was this effect of it being very close to the monument he wanted to study um, and uh, him being driven by the curiosity he would have walked over looked at it and listed it among the things that he found interesting. Um, another monument that, uh, that shows this struggle to come to terms with the discrepancy of what, uh, what he felt were clear categories like the Byzantine unimportant and the Latin uh, um, splendid in style, etc., <coughs> is, uh, of course, in the monastery of uh, uh, Stasusa, where um, he again errs a bit in his uh, contribution of the uh, attribution of the church to the um, Cistercian um, order. So he, at least with a question mark, wonders if this might not have been Beaulieu Abbey. And of course, uh, later on, uh, there is a whole long story of how this was disproven already by himself and then other scholars later on, but um, he is so convinced of seeing a Latin monument with like, Gothic windows and vaults that uh, he even explains in the last sentence that the general plan of the monastery and the short proportions are borrowed from Eastern customs and the apses and archaism, so he finds all kinds of excuses why this is a Latin monument that doesn't look like a Latin monument, instead of uh, thinking the other way around that it might just be a Greek monument um, where uh, Latin masons were employed or masons trained at a Latin building site. So this, these ruins belong to a purely Western art. Is, um, is of course, something that uh, he needed to write to reinforce uh, his perception of this monument. Um, from there, he moves further on uh, to the monastery of Stavrogumi, which is also very unsurprising as it's present in travelogues since the Middle Ages. So he would have followed <coughs> centuries of travelers um, to this very important, uh, also for his relics, a very important monument. Um, stopping at the uh, monastery of St. Barbara on the way, where he also took a picture which it's uh, very interesting that he, uh, he chose this particular uh, angle to document, as there is very little of, of um, architectural uh, splendor in this uh, specific place. And so um, I guess this is also something that for him would have fallen in the category of uh, folkloric documentation. Stavrovuni itself, as you will see at the end of the, um, the talk, 
uh, was interesting to him for a different reason, and this is again a photo taken out of one of his publications so that doesn't appear in the archival collections, because it's a domed church. And this is a topic that will come back a few times that he uh, developed a particular interest in churches with multiple domes. Um, now we're going further towards uh, Lanaka, um, to Kitty, he, he went to see the Latin chapel, but uh, again he mentions in this long footnote that of course there is a Byzantine church with a mosaic, so he does not fail to recognize the importance of that. Meanwhile, when we turn then to Limassol, the next place we have documented from his archive is uh, the church in Kofino. And uh, there uh, he doesn't mention it in the text. So we can only speculate that he started being interested uh, nevertheless in these very picturesque uh, Byzantine period ruins with their wall paintings that look through and th this would have probably uh, triggered the same interest like heaps of carved stones uh, did for him. So th this interest in reassembling what has been lost. Um, then he found a church when uh, looking for a battlefield, uh, at least that's my uh, assumption that the Panaya to Campo was simply where he looked for the famous battlefield of Hirokitia. Um, and uh, while he was there, he would look at the church and find that it has a Gothic-looking portal. And again, uh, we can discuss uh, to which extent this is medieval or post-medieval, but in any case, it reminded him of the uh, urban monuments, Gothic monuments. So he took a picture of it and sort of Gothicized the character of the building while doing so. And then uh, a picture again from, uh, this is from the Mediathek du Patrimoine, where um, uh, we see that he also visited the small ruined church in uh, Topni, uh, and here I assume he went to see if there is any trace of buildings um, that might have anything to do with the famous uh, cross relics. So it's again some external factor, not the uh, rural Greek monument itself that brought him to the place, but while he was there, uh, he could not resist following this curiosity to investigate the monuments. Further down the coastline, uh, he stops at the Monastery of St. Nicholas, again uh, a monument that's uh, mentioned throughout the Middle Ages and post-medieval period in travelogues, um, especially travelers who, who pass by sea uh, will, will be told that this is the famous monastery. So he would have known very well about the building before. And um, I mainly want to talk about another interesting fact of his work with this example. It is that um, in his final publication, he uses very few of the pictures that he took because, of course, printing photographs would have been much more expensive than a uh, black and white uh, print that could be done with the same printing um, models um, as the text. So he sat down and redrew uh, a large number of the photographs that we have in the collections, especially here in, in this new collection today. And uh, this is a particularly nice example because you can follow that he was very precise with the stone, so each stone has the actual size of the stone that was on the picture, but um, he could not resist adding the cats to the drawing that were missing from the picture. And th this is also, it's a recurring topic that he adds small figures, and, and this is very much the 19th century spirit of doing academic drawings, always with a, like, a small ironic comment or some atmospherical Enrichment, which does not mean in his case that they're imprecise, on the contrary, they're very usable, um, just this is what you would find in his book. Um, then it becomes interesting, towards Paphos and further on there is very little photographic evidence and um, it might be um, that he simply did not spend as much time in that area. Um, he speaks about a desolate and inhospitable part of the island. 
uh, and few constructions in an almost uninhabited uh, um, area. Um, uh, and more Byzantine than Gothic, of course, that was also a criterion. So uh, th this might be one of the reasons, but I was also wondering if there was not uh, simply a, a very basic material problem of him running out of photographic uh, <coughs> material because he uses for a later publication a photo of Mavrokardato uh, of Yeros Dipu to illustrate it. So he might have just been without a camera. Um, we jump across the island and now do the other round, starting from Famagusta. Um, he left towards north, towards the Carpos Peninsula, and barely having left Famagusta already comes across the church of uh, Ayoserios, which uh, was interesting because of the buttresses. Of course, buttresses, flying buttresses at that are Western for him, so everything that's a flying bus is no matter of what proportion must be something a bit more Gothic. But he also stops at Ayas Varnavas and uh, takes a lot of pictures of the monastery, and there we come to the question of domes again. Further on, uh, he sees the Panaya Afgasida, which we will hear more about today, so I will not, uh, not discuss it in detail. And then after passing um, uh, an area that uh, where he mentions churches, but we don't have pictures of, so Tricomoy, he, we don't have a picture of this, and so on. He comes to the Carcass Peninsula and takes pictures of all those seemingly Gothic portals. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so Galinoporni uh, or the Eliusa Monastery, and I, I'm wondering if at this point he, it started dawning on him that there is more to it than a clear-cut distinction between Gothic and Byzantine, and if not, he has to sort of widen his concept. But uh, it didn't make it into the book, uh, but uh, I think he was very aware of the limits of this clear distinction. A little bit further on, he finds uh, this ruin and um, starts discovering what he considered the Romanesque on Cyprus. And again, this tells a lot about him, that he sees these buildings that have a very solid masonry, uh, uh, and instead of interpreting them uh, as a high quality of uh, Byzantine workmanship, uh, he interprets them as Romanesque, because uh, that, that was sort of the concept at that time, that if it's high quality, it should originate from France in some way, or at least be in contact with it. And I'm, I'm not saying that to discredit him. It, it was just he, he was a child of his time, and it took him many decades to sort of um, yeah grow out of this uh, this upbringing. Uh, of course, today we know that these monuments have little to do with Romanesque, uh, except that they share certain structural um, approaches that uh, architects automatically. <coughs> came to in order to stabilize uh, uh, the stone vault. Um, and interestingly, he takes a picture of the medieval chapel built into the Panaya of Afentrica and uh, says that it's constructed with beautiful cut stone, but the masonry of the old church is even more remarkable. It has nothing Byzantine about it, and this didn't age well at all. <laughs> but um, uh, again, it's one of those uh, small comments that... Uh, that just show how his scholarship is still extremely relevant uh, despite some error of uh, judgment in the final attribution. Um, then we have this interesting picture that uh, again comes from the Mediathèque du Patrimoine and was interpreted as a ruined church on the Carpas Peninsula. It's I think the only one uh, from his collection that we cannot, uh, um, or at least I was not able to, to attribute to a specific site, so I'm uh, curious if maybe somebody has an idea, but it's lacking distinctive elements simply. So uh, uh, it's probably one of the many ruined churches of the Carpas Peninsula that, again, uh, started interesting him, and I was wondering if it's not, again, the fact that it is a ruin that made it more interesting for him than a fully standing church. And I have to say I can relate to that, that for some reason ruins are always more intriguing than the complete churches. 
Um, he goes on towards Kyrenia, um, past the Pentadactylos monasteries, sees the Church of Antiphonitis, where he makes sure to take pictures of the Venetian period editions, while also mentioning the very important rest of the church, but it's very clear what his focus was here. And the Melandrina monastery, where I assume he probably spent the night, because we know that it served as a guest house in the late 19th century, so, so I imagine that that might have been the reason how he came across this otherwise rather inconspicuous monument, and also was surprised to see their buttresses and um, what he interprets as Western-style paintings, of which, of course, uh, nothing is left today. In the Panagia Absentiotisa, again, he sees the Rip Vault, he goes there, documents the Rip Vault, but, again, speaks about how interesting the Byzantine church is. So it's, again, that, that dialogue between, it's interesting because of the Western style, but also because it's an important Byzantine monument. And then uh, a very odd um, factor coming in the village of uh, Klepini, where he took more pictures than in any other uh, rural village uh, of Cyprus. First of all, of the parish church, which, as you can see, has changed very little, except for a Western edition since he was there. But he does not mention it, uh, neither this church nor the other one that he took pictures of in his text. So um, it remains a bit mysterious what brought him there, um, uh, if it was just a day trip, if a local took him there, or if he visited after um, publishing the book during one of his next stays uh, on the island. This one is just described as igles on the backside of the picture, and it's probably the best documented rural Greek church in the collection. He took three pictures, one from each side and one of the painting inside. But um, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, we can see that it's uh, probably a 15th century church uh, with a very regular ashlar masonry, some nice decorative details like the portal. Um, and I think uh, it should be the so-called Chapel E that uh, Edward Lanson and Sidney Vacher published uh, two decades before. Um, and uh, I was wondering if not this article uh, that he for sure had in his hand as the only one dealing with the medieval uh, monuments of the island before, uh, if he did not have this article and was still aware of where they had seen the church, because they don't give any indication uh, where they saw it. They just say, we saw this ruined church, uh, and that's how it looks. Um, so uh, I'm wondering if not he had this article and was in contact with them, and that's why he went there and devoted so much attention to this church, which still doesn't solve completely where it is, but I fear uh, it is um, the church of the Panagia, uh, because uh, we have Rupert Gannis saying, that the Church of the Panagia, originally of Byzantine workmanship, has been so completely rebuilt that nothing of interest now remains. That's 1936. So it sort of uh, clicks together that the ruin uh, is there, uh, uh, Ola sees it, and then slowly uh, they start rebuilding it in this way. We go on to Kazafani, uh, where uh, he... She, uh, probably did not see in the first uh, journey the Church of the Panea to Potamu because all the pictures in his collections were sent to him by Luigi Baldassar who discovers a tombstone there. So I think this is more of an academic discussion that uh, brings these pictures to him. And uh, we cannot be sure that he actually visited the church. He passes by Kyrenia, of course, taking note of the Byzantine chapel in the castle, which he would have anyway studied uh, in detail, and of the uh, Krizokawa chapel. Going on to Hilarion, where he sees the Byzantine church again in the castle, so it's well framed within a context that he would have studied in detail. Um, further on the northern coast uh, to uh, Lapithos, Again, the Gothic narthex on the Byzantine church. So, so by now you see we're repeating a bit the, the types of ways how you got to see 
these monuments. Um, and he ends up in uh, Morfu, again a church about which we will hear uh, much more later today, so I will not say much about it. Going back to Nicosia, he uh, finds one last church that uh, is of interest to him, um, the Panagia in Akaki, that was torn down as late as 1977 um, to make way for a modern church. And uh, there he points out the flying buttresses. And we know now because of the, the uh, work surrounding the destruction that it was actually a medieval period church that had been remodeled in the 19th century. And this is now uh, one of these coincidental cases where our last picture seems to be one of the very few uh, visual documents. I've, I've not seen any other um, uh, photographs of that church before it was destroyed. An oddity to, uh, to end this journey with, uh, I'm always wondering if this was the church, the first church he saw on the island, or the last perhaps, uh, the Criso Politisa Church in Lanaka, uh, which is of course not medieval, but he takes three pictures of it and uh, and seems to be very interested in it because of looking so Gothic, looking so medieval. So I, I was wondering if it was not very early during his travels that he was getting excited about something that he would later on find out was rather ordinary to have these uh, neo-medieval churches built in the 19th century. Uh, one building I left uh, uh, to the end uh, and took out of the journey, and that's uh, Peristerona, because it uh, leads us to the sort of epilogue to, to, this, um, to this tour of Cyprus, his interest in the Byzantine monuments forming. So I, I said that he took particular interest in these multi dome churches and um, took pictures of pretty much all of them. And it should take uh, almost three decades before he was doing something about this interest in the form of an article um, in Les Églises à Coupole, uh, d'Aquitaine et de Chypre. And in this article, uh, he discusses uh, a book on the dome churches of, uh, of Aquitaine and uh, proposes uh, them to be inspired by the churches of Cyprus. So um, uh, the citation is uh, his last sentence of the article. The dome churches of Aquitaine thus had as their direct model those of Cyprus um, and then attributes this, uh, this well, a transfer to the bishop of Kaof, um, who built his cathedral in 1112. And uh, this is now a very interesting uh, uh, plot twist, uh, I want to say, um, because uh, it shows that at this point, uh, something that probably had festered for many years, this, this thought of how, how is it possible that, uh, that maybe something went the other way, had broken free, and he accepted that, even if now we know that this is uh, also an assumption that cannot be helped, but uh, it shows that he was willing to to see that influence is not a monodirectional thing, but uh, that exchanges can happen in multiple ways. And this is his very last article that he published before he died relatively young in his 60s uh, on the church of baston Boulonnais. So we also arrived back at the, at the site of his birth. That's a small village very close to where he grew up. Um, and on this very interesting Romanesque portal, he says, to consider an influence as unilateral is common but absurd. A people civilized enough to make profitable use of another's people, another people's inventions is generally able to provide in exchange other creations, and it seems that it has always been so. So he has turned around 180 degrees from his initial statement, um, that influence only went one way. Now, of course, we can discuss what the exchanges were, but it shows that um, uh, throughout his work on Cyprus, but also later on on the Crusader States, I have not talked about that now, that he also published the most important volume on the Crusader States, um, he realized uh, this very multifaceted nature of, of cultural and artistic interactions in this area. And I think with that uh, I can finish because
it's a nice word to finish a paper on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions for Simon? Uh, questions or, uh, will be taken after after uh, Mrs. Alcicoglu's uh, talk before the break. Okay. So yeah. So Mrs. Alcicoglu, and then questions at um, we're running five minutes late, so at eleven twenty-five. Thank you. <laughs> Let me. Yeah, but we track this there. So I'll open it twice. For you. But what do you see? Confusing. So, well, if I. I'll just click this and it. Yes, but then it's going to be open twice. Uh -huh. So if I open it, because I track it here. Yeah. Oh. Can I turn the page? Yes, but you have to do this. This? Okay. You go on. Oh, yes, you do this. Yes, can I try? Yes. I think I'll look fine. I think I'll look fine. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. <laughs> Yeah. 
Hello everyone. First I would like to take to Miss Rita for inviting me for this precious conference. My name is Jada Altijolu Kozal. I'm an art historian. I finished my bachelor's in Mima Sinan Fine Arts University and did my master's on history conservation in Oxford Brookes University. And my topic was the Gothic churches converted to mosques. And I would like to say that Camille and Lars' book and the drawings and the research helped me a lot and it inspired me for the further research. <coughs> and today I'll talk about the Gothic churches converted to mosques and the places of interfaith dialogue in architecture, Islam's adaptation of Gothic churches to Islam in Islam in Cyprus. Okay, it will be a little bit challenging for me to change the slides <laughs> because of the technical problems, sorry about that. So first I would like to talk about the historical background in briefly. So <coughs> Cyprus in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, so many invaders came to the Cyprus, so every visitor left their traces, their religion, their technology, their culture, so now we experience and enjoy the multicultural background so we can have the, this multicultural environment right now. Okay. Sorry about that. So first I would like to talk about the predominant religions in the island. So Christianity being the very predominant religion in the island came through the Roman times. So thanks to being to the Holy Land, so it became uh, became the one of the first um, places that experienced the Christianity, and so it changed the cultural background the art and the architecture itself. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. So, even though the Orthodox um, became the predominant in the island. Later, when the Lusignan came, it changed to the Catholics. However, the Western architecture accepted by the local people, however, they never changed living in the Orthodox uh, Christianity. Later in Ottoman times, the Islam uh, religion started to um, spread around and because Ottomans wanted to change the socio-cultural um, structure, urban structure, architecture and art itself in Cyprus. So both Christianity and Islam uh, can be seen with the traces right now in Cyprus. Yes, so first I would like to talk about briefly about the Gothic architecture in Cyprus. So Gothic architecture came to the, uh, Cyprus by the Lusignans, especially with the taste of the kings and the queens because they were inspired from basically from 
parties, and when they came to the Cyprus, they brought their taste and their art and their artists. So it changed the wheel of the island from being the orthodox understanding of architecture to Latin understanding of architecture. So we can see the Gothic architecture in Cyprus. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. So there were three main schools, accords that changed and that inspired the um, Cyprus's architecture in Gothic ways. One is either France, other is Champagne, and the other is Poland. So here you can see the similarity of Notre Dame de Paris with the Saint Sophia Cathedral in Nicosia. Basically, they were inspired from this monument, Notre Dame de Paris. Sorry. Okay. As you can see the plan, basically it's the same plan with simple basilical ways with the um, aisles. They later added these chapels to um, St. Sophia Cathedral. So in the main in the main plan, it was basically the same plan because they were inspired from the same um, same plan itself. And also, just because they brought their own artists from France, from Paris, they could build these important Gothic churches that they were inspired from its origins. So, Hida Lusignan, he was um, the king of the Lusignans, king of the uh, Cyprus, he was known as, and he brought the architecture, religion, uh, the language, so it was basically moved from France to the Cyprus, by his inspiration. So, later when Ottomans came to the Cyprus, they wanted to change the social culture of the island because they wanted to make Cyprus as an Islamic country. So they brought people from Anatolia and what did they do? They changed the important cathedrals from being churches to mosques. Basically, um, when the professor in Oxford Brookes University saw the picture of this uh, minaret on a Gothic church, he was shocked <laughs> and he was surprised and he was, what, what did they do? So basically, they um, kept the structure of these buildings but changed some of the elements to adapt these buildings into mosques. So, at the time, they were believing in monotheistic religion. So, it was one God. So, they were believing in one God. So, they, they didn't hesitate to change these buildings into another monotheistic religion from being a Christian monument to being an Islamic monument. Oops. Sorry about that. Okay. So, um, I would like to briefly talk about the elements of a mosque so we can see what did they change in these big cathedrals? First, the orientation must be changed in through the Qibla, which is a little bit um, towards the southeast. So 
it had to be looking through the Mecca. So the orient orientation of the churches is a little bit Easter. So here you can see in the uh, first one is the mihrab. So it's the primal cave. They describe it as a primal cave. So when the imam uh, chants, they can have the echo inside of the building. And the second one is the dika. It's basically a structure with four <coughs> columns. And when the muezzin chants in the, in the building, so everyone can um, hear him. Third one is the mimbar. It's basically a triangle structure that can imam climbs on it. And on the kutba day, on the Fridays, he can he can give the speech to the um, crowd to the prayers. And third one is the courtyard stores. And the fifth one is the fountain. Um, it is called Shadarvan, so it's a special way of cleaning before the praying so they can use the water to clean themselves. And the sixth one is the minaret. It's basically uh, with the body and a conical cup on it and there's a balcony so Imam can climb on the balcony and he can um, chant so everyone can hear him to go for the praise. So now they have the uh, microphone, so <laughs> they don't need that anymore. So, okay. Okay, basically, what did they do for converting these buildings into the mosques? First, they had to remove all the idols they have inside of the building. Because in Islam, you cannot have any faces, any figures of animals or any human animals because um, they thought that if they would have these images inside of um, a praying place, they could go back to the paganism, so it's all forbidden from the beginning since today. So in these buildings, you can see that all the walls are lime washed. So it's kind of a good thing because if they had in the church any frescoes, any mosaics of, or, or anything, it's lime washed. So lime can breathe. So I think and I hope the frescoes they have inside of these buildings are preserved now. And if we have a chance to take a look with ultraviolet light, maybe we can see through beneath that. And also they put carpets on the floors. So in the Catholic churches they have this um, cemeteries and maybe the inscriptions on the floor and because they were believing in one God and they were really afraid they didn't remove anything they only put the carpet and it's all preserved I hope and I guess but we don't have the chance to remove it because now they're using, using these buildings as mosques So, briefly, I would like to talk about the Ottoman architecture in 16th century. In 16th century, the Ottoman architecture were basically um, inspired by Mima Sinan, architect Sinan. Um, he inspired from Renaissance artists. He read about the Alberti, Palladio. So, he learned the basics of the Renaissance architecture and he adapted his buildings and into Renaissance architecture. So while converting the churches in Cyprus to the mosques, 
they took some of the elements of Renaissance architecture, which was basically inspired by Mima Sinan. So one of his buildings, um, famous building, Suleymaniye Mosque, basically he was trying to make this pyramidal silhouette, the triangle, because the dome was very important because it was representing the uh, heaven. And he was trying to keep it, the whole, um, whole uh, spatial structure, under one dome. So we can see the traces of the taste of the 16th century Ottoman architecture when they added some elements, like this one. And this is uh, two minarets of St. Nicholas Cathedral. Sorry, St. Sophia Cathedral in Nicosia. And this is the uh, Sherefe Park beneath the balcony. You can see the ornamentation. It is called Mukharnas ornamentation, and which has uh, these triangles. If we uh, look at closely, you could have seen that. And it is inspired by the 16th century Ottoman art. Yes, and I would like to talk about the case studies. Oops. And St. Sophia, um, when they convert this um, Gothic cathedral into uh, a mosque, they call it Aya Sophia, inspired from uh, the Aya Sophia in Istanbul. And later in 1954, they changed the name to Suleymaniye Mosque. And basically now people know uh, this building as Suleymaniye Mosque. So it's a French style uh, Gothic architecture built in the half of the 12th century. So according to uh, Strambaldi, he says that the first construction was in 1194 or 95 <laughs> or 93, so in Byzantine period. Later, Amadi claims that, that it was built in 1209, so there is no certainty about the construction date. So later, um, in Mamluk's period, when Mamluk uh, conquered the island in 1425, um, the building was abandoned, and when it was abandoned, a little bit destroyed, and, but of course, it was because of the uh, war they had. And later in 1432, when the John II came to the throne, he repaired the cathedral again. And when the Venetians came to the island, Caterina Cornaro got the throne, and St. Sophia was deserted for a while before the restoration was, um, took place in 1507. And there was a huge earthquake in 1547, so the cathedral um, left neglect, neglected for a while. And later, I can repair it. So we are on a earthquake zone. So this cathedral suffered from many earthquakes from time to time, but still standing with its main structure today. So when the Ottoman came to the uh, Nicosia in 1570, they decided to change this cathedral into a mosque because it was huge, it was glorious, so they wanted to show their power by converting this building into a mosque. So basically, it became the chief mosque in Nicosia. Um, and later in uh, British period, um, it was uh, conserved and maintained by, uh, several times, especially they um, added the mortar, but they didn't know that they shouldn't use the cement, and they used the Portland cement, which actually 
damage the structure because stone and the cement shouldn't be used together because cement is a little bit harder material than the stone and it gives a very bad effect on it. So now it suffers from that. And now this building is on restoration for several years from 20, uh, 2021. Oops. So, um, this building was made by uh, limestone carried from Kyrenia, but um, at the time they didn't have the enough money to carry all the stones from Kyrenia, so they brought other stones from the ruins of Salamis, so you can see the um, ancient uh, columns um, in the structure. And also, um, here it's not visible, but you can see the uh, stonemason's marks uh, on the uh, stone, because they were getting paid day by day, and they were signing them. So, for example, two, two lines and a dot would be my sign, so I would get paid in the end of the day. So now we can see the stone makers um, sign in the building structure. So basically, what did they do? They, um, they assumed that um, inside of the cathedral, it was painted with um, blue decoration and it, wore, it had golden stars but now it's lime washed and we don't know exactly what is hiding behind this limestone. Well, they removed the um, stained glasses and instead of the colorful uh, glass, they used this lime uh, materials, but they kept the style. They kept this uh, gothic style. And also they all removed the altar, altar uh, table and choir part and all the stairs and they left it blank with the carpets. Oops. Also, um, there was a visit of Sultan Aziz in 1874, so they decided to add a huge entrance to the abscess part, to the southern part, sorry, the eastern part of um, the building, um, but they kept this um, pointed arch, this style, they didn't change this style even though uh, it was in the seven, uh, 1874, and they opened this door, they added this calligraphy into the building, but the Sultan never came to the island, <laughs> so it was one of them. Well, and the second uh, case study is the St. Nicholas uh, Cathedral. And they call it Lala Mustafa Pasha Mosque after the co uh, conversion to the mosque. So it stands in the Namakya Mosque Square in Famagusta. And it's one of the um, beautiful Gothic architecture in Cyprus. So the construction date goes 1300 um, however it took it took a while to finish this building lack of the money it was built with the shiny local stone it's a, a special type of stone it's it's very um, yellowish so with the sun, it shines. And see, uh, again here, you can see the, the stonemaker's uh, marks. But 
in in the uh, Nicosia it was more visible. So, according to the landmark, the sculptors of the Saint Nicholas were chosen by the architect by person to carve specific parts of the decoration. So this building is more ornamented than uh, the one in Nicosia. So here is the plan. So you can see this octagonal uh, axis with three aisles and seven arches with huge pillars. And also later they added one minaret instead of the bell towers. So here you can see the inside of the building. So no uh, outer panel, no stairs, only the carpet. And we hope that beneath that they still have the uh, elements of the uh, Christians. But they kept the um, red walls and they didn't line wash it, so you can see the um, Gothic architecture with that. Oh, and there is an uh, inscription um, in the um, in the eastern part of the uh, building on the flying backrest, so we can see the detail and we can learn the details from this inscription about the construction work. Later in um, Ottoman times, they added a funeral house, which you can see the funeral car now uh, from 19th century. And this is the minaret they add. There is only one minaret in this one, but in uh, Nicosia there were two because they, they make the uh, minaret to show the importance of the uh, building. So here, it's um, for me, it's very nice to keep the Gothic style with the minaret because they could have changed it, they could have um, make it in Ottoman style, but they uh, respected the style and they kept the minaret with the Gothic style, I guess. So this is the interior of the building. Um, this is the um, main rock that I talked about. And there is a tree, um, which is now 723 years old. Uh, it's kind of a fig tree and stands uh, still today. And they built two tombs. Ottoman tombs belongs to the imams. And the last um, case study is the um, Church of St. Peter and Paul, and they called it Sinan Pasha Mosque. So this building changed to the mosque, uh, converted to, to the mosque later in 1600. And you can see that it's more plain, not ornamented, and basically it looks like a Norman style rather than Gothic style, but some elements, especially in northern, uh, <coughs> northern, here you can see, uh, door, it's ornamented, just because there was a palace next to it, and this door was connected to, with a lane to the palace, so they ornamented this part more than the facade because the facade is here, is not that ornamented. So it was built by a merchant, um, an historian merchant, because at the time Nicosia was, uh, sorry, Famagusta was um, a trading place and a cultural place. So the merchant earned a lot of money from that, and he thought that he should spend his money into a mosque, uh, sorry, into a, a church, so he decided to build this church with that money, some of that money. 
And here you can see the flying buttresses. The southern facade was um, damaged. And basically, half of it was collapsed because of an earthquake, and they built that again. And here you can see the turret, and there was flux in the uh, church. However, in the, by conversion, this building into a mosque, they added this minaret onto that turret, but couldn't survive for today. Yes. So um, the history of this building is very important, I guess, um, and very interesting because um, in British times, they used this building as a grain store. So they removed the mosque elements and started to use this building as a grain store and later as a fuel store. Uh, for the First World War, because in 1916 it was filled with the fuel and I think it was just a waste for using this building as a storage. And later they put... Um, sorry. Um, they put some machines inside of the building and they were using this building as an orange factory. And here you can see the uh, grains that were carrying throughout this <laughs> monument. And that's why they call it Budai Jami. It's a, Budai means grain in Turkish. So people call it Budai Jami. And now, um, inside of the building, the lime wash was removed and all the elements, all the Christian elements and the Islamic elements are now removed and they um, use it for, for just visiting to, uh, for, as museum, I guess. And there are some uh, tombs belongs to um, important people uh, in Ottoman period. Yes, this is the plan. It's a basic plan with three uh, abscess and three aisles and four pillars. Oh yeah, and this is the uh, fresco that they have found when they remove the lime wash and this is the proof that if we remove the lime wash inside of these buildings we might find the frescoes or the mosaics that lying beneath that and um, this is a scene from uh, 40 martyrs of Sabas uh, from 15th century and now it is conserved and it's a really good uh, conservation made for this fresco and they uh, saved it. Yes, this is the mineral that I talked about. It was uh, very dangerous to keep it so it collapsed and they didn't build it uh, again so it wasn't using as mosque anyways. And these are my references. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions for the first two presentations? Everything's been covered? <laughs> okay, so we invite you to have coffee with us for a coffee break for 20 minutes and then we'll return for the rest of the presentations. Thank you, everyone. We hope the break was a good leg like, stretcher. So I'd like to call Mr. Javi Giragos. And again, as before, we have uh, Mr. Javi Giragos and Ms. then Mr. Fulias. And uh, before lunch break, which will be provided at the same place, uh, we're going to take any questions as before. Thank you. Hoping that the coffee was helpful for all of us. <laughs>
good morning. I uh, will try to present. I was in, interested in the use of figures, less the cat, but I saw also the cat and I was. <laughs> Yes, it's nice to see how these additions are able to talk to us about the author, about his age, his period, and about all the baggage he was carrying. Most of all because, uh, as the title of the um, today's symposium is imposing us, we are looking through his eyes and his ways of understanding. So, even his architecture since ever was based on the human figure, from Vitruvius on. The visual representations of architecture are usually figureless. From the ancient times uh, through all over the historic periods of depictions of architecture, human figures are quite absent. Even in the uh, historical period where the humans were the center of the depictions and of, of the philosophy and therefore of the depiction, even in that case in the 15th century, uh, Italy, the architecture is quite separated from what are the figures and the human representation. Figures in the architecture in, uh, in the Renaissance are used uh, merely as decoration giving the mood and the proportions, the scale but when the artist was aimed to talk about architecture, the architecture was humanness. I, I like this guy. I, I wanted to talk about him and Anlar, but at the end I changed. But I, I, I will try to compare at least a part, which is this one, the use of or the non-use of human figures within the study of architecture. He was studying uh, the Venetian Go Rom uh, Romanic and uh, Gothic architecture 50 years before and last. Uh, and even if in his three-volume book he's concentrate on the humans as creators of architecture, he very much underlined the importance of masons and the way they personally use their hands, their knowledge and their tools in order to create something important. And he became the manifesto of, of what comes right after in England. His book is full of repertoire of uh, decorative elements, decorative architectural details, very much based on the evolution of natural forms in architectural decorations, his landscapes are absolutely humanless. There is a dramatic absence of the human presence in all his landscapes in the book. And I repeat, the way he used, the anthropocentric way of using the mason within the book, the philosophy he creates around the artisan, the craftsman of the past, it's um, remarkable. Nevertheless, humans are not present in his book. And let's go to our guide. We have heard in the morning that he is a child of, of, of his period, of his background. And in his book, he's uh, representing, for the reasons we have heard, drawings made by him and 
and he's proud of it, uh, are all signs of pride, uh, with the um, repertoire of all the details and the um, um, patterns, sketches of um, the um, buildings, without the human presence, most of them, quite 90% of the representations of uh, the enlarged sketches in the publication are human -based. We have some humans used as references for the scale, and some of them are used to give the atmosphere, the mood, or the use of architecture within the society he was observing. Of course, some of these can be uh, associate, associated with the comments we can read in the book about the status of some buildings, but we have no mentions on humans in the book. He's not talking about Cypriots and the architecture of the space in the book. And in the same way, we cannot find them really within the depictions of the publication. But he was a man that was um, aware of everything that happened before him and around him. And this is the reason he was able to change his mind, as we have heard, uh, and reconsider the way influences uh, can be applied. So, in the depictions of architecture, at least from the 17th century, early 17th century, and the Flanders, the human figure is placed, has this uh, central decorative role. It gives us the possibility to understand the scale, the use of a certain place, open or interior, and uh, the mood that goes around from that uh, cultural area. Very soon, the um, Mediterranean um, courts and cultures took the advantage of the use, the better advantage of the use of the genre of landscape with human figures. The 18th century is maybe the peak of these use of the so-called maquette, the specs, the, this small uh, inter, uh, human figured interventions within the depiction in order to give uh, the uh, mood, the use, uh, the color of the landscape. If we observe them, are just figurines are without any personality. They have no attention on the human element, but they are just there to remind us how the landscape is used and by who. There is more attention on their attire, for instance, than their um, um, figures, uh, faces, uh, hands, colors are the maquette, the specs, that are helping us to understand better the landscape. By the way, we are surrounded by such kind of depictions. We are in the 15th century room. <coughs> Artists were interested in the collection of uh, a repertoire of this kind in order to use them. Bellotto, for instance, uh, Canaletto's um, niece, is here using them in the best way possible in order to give us the possibility to understand the landscape through the use of humans, real landscape. But even in the non-real landscapes, humans are there, are important for the same reason. I think the best example regarding this um, um, way of uh, using human figures is Piranesi with his etchings where humans are there to give a certain tone, a certain music, a certain color on the ruins, these beloved 
um, objects of the Grand Tour and also of the um, connoisseurs and the uh, people that were interested even professionally later on on the study of architecture. The um, shrine of ruins is important and human figures are there for the reason we have said. Are just like the, the, uh, the painted maquette, even the uh, maquette in, uh, in Piranesi etchings are just lines and dots, specks, in order to give us this atmosphere. This is an interesting etching made, published by Wagner in the second half of the um, uh, 18th century, by the end of the 18th century in Venice. Um, Zotti was the painter. We have an, an interesting ancient ruin with two groups of humans and a dog in the middle. And an, an interesting inscription. L'incolta gente il bel non guarda o cura. The uh, uneducated people are not able to see or to take care of beauty. In this case, we have a judgment. We, in this case, the figures, they have a certain role, are there to demonstrate that are not able, are not at the, at the level to appreciate and take care of the uh, heritage, the cultural heritage uh, they they have. Our uh, Anlar is using the figures in the very same way. He's using them to give a scale and to give the mood. It's quite clear that they are there in order to let us understand how big the door was, what was the use of them, and the and they add with the color of their attire. In his albums, because we pass now from the book in, in this other big content of the album photos, and I, I am trying to share with, I will try to share with you some observations regarding the use of the human figures in the photos that are, could be different than the use of human figures in the book. Uh, in this case, uh, we have humans present in order to give us the possibility to understand the use of the place. For instance, at your left, you can see the female and the male elementary school of the village of Kalopanayotis. The male one is under a tree, an olive tree, and the female one is just there on the small lodge of the building. Uh, the markets and the inhabitants, he, he, he's taking uh, in consideration in the uh, photo, the human element as an important element to understand, maybe. We have to have soundtrack as well. <laughs> um, so, uh, we have also a certain number of photos with uh, chops extra urban and urban jobs, a certain interest, a certain eye of ethnographic uh, interest, which is not extraordinary as well, because we, we have this kind of interest at least from a century before, the travelers talking or sketching or etching, it goes hard <laughs> <laughs> with the soundtrack, but I like it. Um, so, we have um, uh, Mariti, for instance, that is describing the attire and the jobs with certain elements, with certain details. Um, 
Namidieu as well, and all the others. And he is showing us through his photos, and with no mention in the book, this interest, this anthropocentric, ethnographic uh, interest with some uh, maybe um, anthropologic questions that he is posing through his lens, we can imagine, about the jobs uh, I will, uh, where is Yanis? I will give you the opportunity to talk about these interesting scenes. We can emerge in and find um, realities that we were not uh, aware before, or better, uh, we have the opportunity to open a door and go through a century and a half experience, visual experience of a certain reality. Another kind of photos with humans we have are the touristic photos. We have foreigners that are posing in front of a large photo camera. And are there for these, per I mean, the photos are there to document the purpose, the visit. The descriptions are telling us the same. Then we have portraits, which I I have to admit, but I find very uh, af no, it's not a matter of uh, being fascinating uh, or fascinated by, by by the photos. Humans are attracted by human figure, and when I'm looking at these portraits, these or these portraits, I uh, I feel that the author was interested in humans. Despite the fact that the humans are not present in the book, both on the text and the depictions, he was, for a certain reason, or a quantity of reasons, linked, interested, by human figures, by, by the locals, the Cypriots, the Carpacites in this case. So, uh, we are not able to know why these couple, for instance, were um, photographed by him, but through his lens, through his interest and through his eyes, combine these photos with all <coughs> these. We can reconstruct some details of the reality of the late 19th century Cypriot way of being, attitudes, attire, jobs, habits, customs, etc. I repeat, there is nothing extraordinary in this. We have seen or read or read everything or quite everything about Cypriots in that period. In this case, his rich album is important to us in order to reconfirm to us some of the things we were aware of and gives us, it, he's giving us the possibility to try to understand the reasons and the um, Maybe the um, intentions he had regarding the object and the subject of his photo. So, uh, it's possible through uh, his album to recreate or to talk about the way the Cypriots uh, were in that specific uh, moment. He is using them not just as models, like the portraits, but as part of their habitat. Uh, and he is giving us the possibility to look in the eyes of Cypriots 
like a bridge of more than a century. So, he is not using humans in the depictions of his book, following the long tradition of architectural, represent architectural representations in two dimensions. He is not exceptional in that, and he is not exceptional in trying to take uh, testimonies of images of uh, ethnographic interest. This is not exceptionality, it's nice, it's important, because we <laughs> It's true that we are studying history through the exceptional figures. But the real history is that of the non-exceptional figures, the non-exceptional ways. These are the core of what is happening. And he is, with all these not exceptional things, he is exceptional for us. Otherwise, <laughs> there is no reason to have a presentation like uh, uh, the book, the, the important book we are going to see or would have saw outside. Wonderful, by the way. Um, so, Cypriots are there more in the album than in the book, and are there telling us what he was able to understand from them. Now, is on us to understand what he was thinking because we have nothing written on this subject and how this affects him. This is an open question and as such the best way to conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Patrick Giriagos. Uh, and now we continue with Mr. Fulias' presentation. And uh, before the lunch break. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to dedicate this presentation uh, to the memory of my dearest friend, <coughs> Tunjo Bayushkan, with whom I first visited the Panagia of Gazida. Firstly, I would like to thank the CVAR and the Costa Severidas Severis Foundation for the kind invitation to speak at the conference on Camilo and Lark and for the use of their valuable photographic archive. I would also like to thank the Department of Antiquities for granting me permission to use its photographic archive and my colleagues, Bulen Kizil Duman, Eric Hury, and Tassos Papakostas for their kind collaboration. I would, also, I would also like to mention that this presentation uh, will soon be published in the next volume of the Epistemoniki Epetirida Pesieras Bonesquito. The Monastery of Panagia of Gacida is located 16 kilometers northwest of the city of Famagusta, near the villages of Sandalaris, Aloa, and Milia. The church and monastery complex had been declared as ancient monuments by the, by the Department of Antiquities of the Republic of Cyprus before 1974. The monastery's church, which was dedicated to the Virgin Mary, 
was demolished in the summer of 1974. And today, only the two monastic uh, buildings remain, alpine in poor condition and serving or was serving as animal pens. I built with the monument again a few years ago during the proceedings of the Fifth International Archaeological Conference of the Holy Metropolis of San Agustin and Constantia. Since then, some new interesting pieces of information have emerged. The first information about the demolition of the church reached our site only in 1989, while in the bibliography it was reported until a few years ago as destroyed during the 1980s or in 1991. These pieces of, of information obviously do not hold, as it is confirmed through testimonies of eyewitnesses with whom we spoke that the church was completely destroyed after August 1974, following the order of the Turkish military commander immediately after the military occupation of the area. The demolition of the monument was obviously not accidental, but was done in retaliation for the shocking and of incredible brutality murders of 126 women, men, and children from the neighboring Turkish Cypriot villages of Sandalaris, Aloha, and Marathon on August 14, 1974. The atrocious crime was committed by members of the illegal organization Eoka Vida on August 14, 1974 the day the second phase of the Turkish invasion began. Because of this crime, apart from the demolition of the church, in the following few years, few days, sorry, Turkish soldiers executed a number of Greek Cypriots in Palekistro, as well as 83 Greek Cypriot villagers from the village of Asha. Through this, through this presentation, uh, I will, <coughs> I will uh, try to restore the history of the monument, mainly using the archives of Hamid and Lard, Theophilus Mogapka, and Athanasius Papagiorgiou. I will also use the records of the Byzantinologist Chrysanthim Baltoyanni from, from the year 1965, whose notes we are preparing for publication together with my colleague, Dr. Christodoulos Kaji Christodoulos. The first written reference to the monastery includes, includes it in a list of a small of the small village of Kazali of the province of Famagusta in an Italian description of Cyprus at the end of the 15th century. This description was copied by Frank Strong in 1533 and translated in Greek by Neoclis Kiriazis in his journal Kipriaca Chronica. Immediately after the Ottoman conquest of 1571, the monastery was in operation and was recorded in the first census of 1572. In the 18th century, Archimandrite Kiprianos classified it amongst, among the, monaster, the monasteries subordinate to the archbishopric. Camille Lard, Camille Lard's text on the monastery and his Catholicon can be found in his monumental work of Gothic and Renaissance architecture in Cyprus, uh, which is brief but significant. Descriptions are even more abstract. Descriptions that are even more abstract are given by George Jeffrey in 1918 and Rupert Ganis in the 1930s. One of the last residents of the monastery was a wise and deeply religious elder, Florentus Mikhail Pachas, from Milla village, known as Haji Florentus. Haji Florentus used to sleep on the floor of the church in front of the iconostasis as an offering to the Virgin Mary. The elder passed away on October 10, 1969, inside the monastery and was buried in his village in Milia. We, 
When Camille Enlart visited the place in the late 19th century, he mentioned that it was an old Greek monastery with an unknown history. The monastic complex consisted of three buildings, the small double aisle church with two semicircular apses to the east and two separate adjacent monastic buildings, one north uh, of the church and in an L shape dating back to the 16th century and another B shaped complex to the east from the 18th century. The southern older part of the church had a dome, while the newer northern part was covered with growing vaults. From Enlar's initial reference, we can infer that he indirectly acknowledged the antiquity of the Byzantine church, but without any further reference on it. He also noted that the church was small and its northern aisle underwent Gothic interventions, which he commented on, drew, and photographed. He also pointed out that the northeastern apse was not in use by the Greek Orthodox, a fact he attributed to its previous use by the Latin rite. We will return to this issue. Externally, the church had reinforcing flying buttresses to the north and west, which, according to Enlart, were built after an earthquake, most likely in the 16th century. Similar reinforcing buttresses exist at the church of St. Sergius at Bacchus in the neighboring village of, uh, <coughs> of Ayos Serios. We saw it before. The lintel on the northern aisle doorway had a, an, an ogee decoration on the lower part and was supported by small corbels. A similar lintel is also found in the cruciform church of Hagia Baraskevi in the medieval town of Rhodes, dating back to the 15th or early 16th century. Athanasius Papagiorgiou, who carried out maintenance work at the monastery in 1968, dated the, southern, the southeast section of the church to the 12th century. The Byzantine church belongs to the dome hall type and has round arches and semicircular vaults, a fact that is confirmed by the unique and very significant plan of section prepared by him. In the 15th century, radical changes were made to the church. After the demolition of the northern wall of the middle Byzantine church, the northern aisle was added, which was covered with cross-growing vaults. According to Enlart, the vaults where, where pointed barrel vaults with reeds supported by brackets, one of which had the form of a female bust with a cross round her neck. The northern wall of the original church was demolished, and in its place, two strong pointed arches were built, converting the church into a double aisle wall. Piers on the western and eastern walls supported the Gothic arches and a strong quart quatrefoil impost was placed be between them, resembling that of Panagia do Trigono. During the same period, the church was expanded towards the west. The western expansion, which had the same width as the two air aisles, was also covered with cross walls. The architectural difference between the two sections of the church was further emphasized by the newer northern aisle, which was taller and longer than the older Byzantine one, yet lower in comparison to the top. <coughs> in 
In the district of San Agusta, there are similar double churches from two different chronological phases, which were expanded during the Latin rule, mainly in the 15th or 16th century, such as Panagia Theotogos de Gomu, the Church of Prothromos in Lapathos, the Catholic of Eleusa in Rizzocatpaso, and others. This widespread ar architectural practice during the, this period allows, allows us to speak of a standardization in the construction of these churches as arcues. Regarding Afghasida, the reasonable question arises, why was the expansion towards the north made? Certainly, it was to double the interior space and provide more spaciousness. However, was that the only reason? The length of the newer northern isle was greater than the corresponding southern one. As the space of the sanctuary and apse protruded about two to three meters further east, as shown in the plan and in the existing photographs. This layout, despite widening the interior of the, of the church, obviously did not aim to create a unified uh, sanctuary. On the contrary, it created a distinct and independent new sanctuary which was probably related to the celebration of the liturgy in the Latin rite. Was this layout result, the result <clears throat> not of peaceful coexistence, or on the contrary, of conflict and segregation between the two doctrines? Obviously, the issue of common worship between Orthodox and Latin rites, it's a much debated matter and requires systematic study. This presentation clearly cannot exhaust the subject or, or satisfactorily address it. Similarly, there is also the case of the Middle Byzantine Church of Sotiras Christos in the left Crete, where the single aisle dome church was expanded southwards in the early 16th century with a single aisle vaulted church with its sanctuary isolated so that both doctrines could be served in this case as well. Enlar, in his brief description, mentions a tombstone slab located inside the northern aisle with a Greek inscription that was difficult to read, featuring the carved, the carved figure of a man wearing Western attire. He continues by writing that only the phrase ekimisi odulos en mini septembrio in dictiono, in dictionos sigma bi yota was preserved, and not the name of the depicted individual, which Enlart interpreted as September 15, 1482. Enlart associates the depicted figure with sponsorship for the construction of the Northern Eye, but this could also be a later donor who had paid for the privilege of being buried in the church. There are three interesting facts concerning this person. First, Although his name was not preserved, the language and the phrasing of the inscription makes us conclude that he was a Greek. Second, he is dressed in pure European fashion, a, a tablet with puffy sleeves with sleeves, puffy breeches, and an elegant hat. Third, his tombstone was located in the northern, presumably Latin Rite Church. Was this person a Greek converted to the, to the Latin Rite? In Imo's important work on the funerary, funerary slabs on Cyprus, of Cyprus, there are many examples of slabs belonging to deceased with Greek names and located in churches of the Latin Rite. 
or are, are these signs of a form of interpretation? It is a subject that has sparked the interest of many scholars in the last decades, but I must proceed. Ruben Ganis, in 1936, also refers to the tombstone which was built between the buttresses on the northern wall, as he writes about a partially destroyed description from which he read the name George, and in the date of death, and the date of death in 1482. So he agrees with Enlar uh, in that, on that. As Anasius Papayuri in 1968 um, found the tombstone fragment, fragmented, and partially preserved, mentioning only the dating read by Enlar. During a recent visit to the monastery, uh, we located three pieces of this tombstone, as seen in the photo. The largest fragment bears the torso of a man with his hands crossed on, on his chest. Another piece carries an eligible inscription on an open scroll as described by Enlar. As far as we could see, we did not discern the name George on the inscription of the broken tombstone. Neither Faisal mentions the name George in his reading. The latter reads various letters without particular meaning, but agrees with the dating. In the same room, there is another intact burial slab and uh, marble architectural members, probably medieval. Slabs with libation holes are mainly found in early Christian monuments related to important burials and holy figures, such as in the cases of the tombs of St. Barnabas in Engomi, St. Lazarus in Larnaca, and St. Spirion in Remetusha. In the case of the tombstone at the martyrium of the Basilica of St. Barnabas, as well as in, the, as in other instances, the tombstone served as a mensa martyrs, meaning that liturg liturgical functions were performed on it. It is unknown if these objects in Afghazida are related or belong to different burial monuments, as we cannot know their original position. In my opinion, they belong to different variants. While it is risky to persuasively argue about the nature of the northern compartment of the Abbasidas Church, we could speculate that considering the burial slab with a potential male donor was embedded in the northern wall, this section had a funerary character similar to the 14th century Latin chapel in Angelocti Stichidiu. When Enlart visited Algazira at the end of the 19th century, he mentioned that the auxiliary buildings north and east of the church served as an annex to a chiflik. The next documentation of the size condition is provided by Theophilus Mokapka, <coughs> photographic archive, indicating that, likely, that he likely carried out repairs of the buildings. The photographs taken in 1941 show the buildings in good condition, affirming this possibility. Sadly, the current condition of this structure is tragic. During our recent visit, we observed with regret that section of sections of both auxiliary buildings of the monastery have collapsed. What impressed the French researcher the most in the northern building was a marble capital with Gothic ornamentation, which remains in place to this day. He also refers to spolia reused in, this, in the construction of the monastery, which he speculates may have originated from an earlier building uh, but we couldn't see any early building actually there. 
In enlarged photographs, in addition to the croquet capital, a Pan-Christian lamp, uh, lamp stand is visible. Another photograph from the Mogapgab archives shows the marble base of a column with a Pan-Christian cross, which unfortunately could not be located. As previously mentioned, the Argasida Church was in operation until 1974. Information about the interior of the church is gathered from two photographs from enlarged archives, several from Theophilus Mugabka 1941 archive, and some from the Department of Antiquities in 1968. In the first photograph by enlarged, we can see the wooden staircase leading to the five-sided pulpit, which can be dated to the 18th century. The icons flanking the pulpit are works from the same period and in the style of the so-called School of St. Iraclidius Monastery. The images on the pulpit, from left to right, depict the following. The evangelists Mark and John Christ in the middle, and Matthew and Luke. On the opposite side, the richly decorated wooden Episcopal throne is visible. The iconostasis of the Northern Isle was located further to the east due to the difference in length between the two sanctuaries. We can see the difference here. <laughs> The iconostasis dating back to the 18th century covered the entire width of the double aisle church. The iconostasis of the southern aisle was the central as the rectangular holy altar was located in its house. You can see it here, the altar. Hence, apart from the series of the despotic icons, there were two additional rows with the icons of the Dodecaorto and the Apostles from the 18th century. The top of the iconostasis crested by the figure of the crucifix and one of the Libera, while the other is not visible or was missing. The lower part of the iconostasis is occupied by filling panels belonging probably to two different per periods. Some of the panels are without any decoration or simply were damaged, and some they had inscribed ornamentation with geometric and floral motifs. Three sanctuary doors interrupt the row of filling panels. On the northern wall inside the sanctuary, the holy process is visible. In front of the royal door, two bronze ca candelabra are visible. Inside the holy bima at the holy altar, a silver processional cross, pro processional cross probably the cover of the chalice, are visible. <coughs> According to the custom of the time, covers are hung in front of the despotic icons, making it difficult to recognize their subject. Christ was depicted as a great high priest and bore the date 1729, while next to the icon of the Theodokos of the Yitria, there was the icon of three military saints, Trifon, Eustathios, and uh, Julian, of the 1759, made by the monk Ioannikios. This is Christ, this is the Odeitria, and here we can see in the computer is more clear, uh, the three military cells. And this is uh, the, the woman's face from uh, Mugabgab uh, archives. In the second photograph by of Enlard, which depicts again the interior from the northwest, on the left, the opening of the ideas might visible, 
as in his, uh, as his, as in his drawing. A similar entrance of a yasma exists inside the church of Panagia Kiskiras in the Livadia Famagusta, which was connected to a subterranean carved system of water channels. North and northeast of the monastery of Gazira, there is a complex of carved channels for water transportation, which contributed to the preservation of rich plantations in the area. In front of the pews, a metal plate or dish uh, can be distinguished, which Enlard mentions in his book and dates back to the 15th or 16th century. It looks like the one he, uh, from his photographs or from Bella Dice. Apparently, he, put, he placed the, this dish there himself to be photographed. In the same photo, on the right, a rare example of women's section and gallery with a wooden grill and a separate entrance is discernible in the corner, an influence apparently stemming from the Ottoman equivalent arrangement of women's sections in Muslim, in Muslim mosques. A similar construction is in a small gallery or women's section is preserved today in the Church of the Holy Cross in Pelendri. In the monasteries Catholicon, significant frescoes were preserved, which unfortunately were completely destroyed during the demolition of the church. In some printed or, or electronic articles, it is mentioned that the frescoes were first removed from the walls and then the monastery was demolished. Unfortunately, there is no indication that the frescoes are preserved in any way. In the dome, in the dome covering the southern aisle, the imposing figure of the Pantocrator, surrounded by a rainbow dating to the 15th century, was preserved, and by two zones around him. In the inner zone, the preparation of the throne, the daisies and the angels, and the outer lower zone, where enthroned apostles were depicted. Here is the preparation. The depiction of the, uh, of the rainbow around the Pantocrator also appears in other monuments as, such as the Holy Cross in Pelendri, 14th century, in Christos Antiphonitis in Calovrea, 15th century, and the Panagia Theodokos uh, in Dricomo from the 16th century. In the church, there were also remarkable portable icons. In the notes, of the, of the Byzantinologist Chrysostom Baltoyanni uh, from 1965. Around 30 icons of the monastery are documented, most of, we, of which date back to the 18th century. The oldest and now lost icon of the monastery depicted the Anosen i Profite, dating around 1500. The partially destroyed icon was located in the Holy Bima. Before 1974, another icon depicted Virgin Mary Glicophilusa from the 16th century, from the iconostasis of the Northern Isle, wearing an earring. You can see it here. It's a rare uh, <coughs> thing. Uh, was transferred to Nicosia for conservation. As a result, it was saved, and it is currently housed in the Byzantine Museum of the Archbishop Macarius Foundation. The same happened with an icon of Christ from the northern nave, dated with an inscription to 1729 during the Arch Archbishop of Sylvester. Additionally, in the iconostasis of the, of the southern nave, there was also an icon of Christ 
from 1763, dedicated to the monastery by Archbishop Paisius. An inscription found below the icon of St. John Monastery of St. John the Baptist stated that in the year 1781, the painters Leontios and Philaretos from the monastery of St. Iraclidios gilded the curved iconostasis of the southern isle. The same inscription recorded that they also painted the Lipira, the sanctuary doors, the Dodecaorto, the Apostolica, as well as the icons of the Virgin Mary, St. John the Baptist, Archangel Michael, St. George, the Evangelist, and the Pulpit. Except for the two icons saved in Nicosia, all the others are missing. In one of the sanctuary doors, dated back to the 18th century, on the left leaf, above the, 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 um, the I can see the, the word. So, um, near the Annunciation uh, was depicted, and below, then Gregory and Chrysostom holding and gospel. On the right leaf, the Virgin Mary, seated on a low wooden throne, was depicted, and below were the saints Basil and Nicholas. Dear friends and colleagues, it is certain that the loss of human lives cannot be compared to anything else. On the other hand, the destruction of the Church of Argasida and other Cypriot monuments was a significant loss for our civilization. We would wish that all tragic and condemnable events that preceded and followed the events of August 1974 had never occurred. Today, the ruins of the, ruins of the monastery and the graves of all in unjustly lost men, women, and children are there to remind us of the tragic events of the past and that the vicious cycle of violence should definitely come to an end. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Tullias. Um, are there any questions for uh, these uh, last two presentations? Yes, please. Yeah, um, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Tullias, uh, what is the etymology of uh, the name of Casida and whether there are other parallel names for the monastery? We don't know the so the, the actual uh, uh, from where it comes, but uh, maybe it's from uh, Don. It's a V in in the in Greek. Don. Uh, Don. Yeah. Maybe, but there is no any comparison. I mean, any any uh, similar names. Um, Maybe I should look into it. Look into it. I'm, uh, I studied linguistics, so I'm a bit of a Thank you. Any more yeah. questions? Yeah. It's possible I have a question for uh, Thomas Kassenberger? Yes. So, I mean, we know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would have to ask you later. Thank you. But um, you mentioned that he was, uh, Angar was intrigued by the Dome churches. What about the Baltic churches? In my village, was mentioned uh, by Mr. Funyas is Labathos, and it's six miles away from Picomo that we have the 14th century vaulted church. Single vault. Like there is one in Canada, in Greece, in Greece, in Greece. He, he doesn't mention uh, many of these smaller churches. I think with the dogs, it was just that he was intrigued by the extraordinarily looking ones in France so uh, when he found something that looked like what he was wondering about inside was he started looking more for it um, so uh, the, the small churches we have very little evidence that he stopped at, at which of them he stopped so it was more of a coincidence that mm -hmm. that was his he must have passed because going to Argasida from Tomo is quite 
I, I, I hear that's one of the ones that he deemed miserable uh, <laughs> because uh, of his well, lack of depth of recognition for all that is in culture. Thank you. Any more questions? So if uh, uh, let's uh, proceed to light lunch, which is offered uh, at the reception, along with French wine offered by the Vaso Siliadis Limited. Thank you, and we'll be back at 2.30.